If we allow the machinery of our Sunday morning church services to become too important to us, we risk offering unacceptable sacrifices to God. Let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Nathan Smith. Welcome to the Blueprint Sounds video blog, and today we're going to talk about machinery. 1 Kings 6-7. So Solomon is building the temple of God. And there's all of these measurements and talking about the chambers and the timbers. And in the middle of that, all of that talk about the chambers, there's this astonishing statement. First Kings 6, 7. The house, while it was being built, was built of stone prepared at the quarry. And there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool heard in the house while it was being built. No tools at the temple site. That's crazy. If you go to a construction site, all you see are tools. You hear hammering and drilling and cranes and everything. Like, that's what job sites are about, is tools. Aside from the logistical question of how in the world do you fit stones to go together that are perfectly fitted away from the temple grounds at the quarry, another question is why? Solomon certainly didn't do it for efficiency. He must have done it because God wanted it that way. So why didn't God want the sounds of any tools on the site of his temple? Here's what I found out. So Strong's Concordance has two words for tool in Hebrew. The first is chereb, I think I'm saying it right, which is a cutting tool, a sword, or a dagger. The second word, and this is the word used in 1 Kings, is keli. And keli has a lot of meanings, just like a lot of words in Hebrew, they, they refer to multiple things. Kali means something prepared. Any apparatus, implement, utensil, dress, vessel, or weapon. This can even include shepherd's bags, wagons, or jewelry. If we look back at last week's scripture, where David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, he's carrying it on a wagon, which is a kali. It's a vessel. It's something prepared to hold something. Well, God was very specific that that's not how you do it. You don't carry my presence in a kali. You don't carry it in a vessel or an apparatus. You carry it on top of the shoulder of a person. That's where he wants his presence to rest. Interesting. Why? Why was that so unacceptable to God? And why did a man lose his life when they were trying to transport things that way? I believe the answer is idolatry. So when we think about Israel, they're a very peculiar nation. God calls them a chosen people and he calls them set apart. The other nations around Israel carved images, right? Graven images out of wood or out of stone. And one of the first things that God says is, you shall, you'll love the Lord your God and you shall not have any craven or engraved images. There are a lot of other things that were different about Israel. So let me just read a couple of them. They rested on the Sabbath. They had a special diet. They didn't cut the sides of their heads and they were circumcised. Big difference. They also had no image of God that they worshiped. We already talked about that. And all of those sacred vessels that the Levites would carry, they were carried over the shoulder and not transported by cart. It would seem like that God's law puts them at a disadvantage compared to the other nations around them. However, the sun stood still when they fought a battle. Their crops were blessed. They rested their land every 50th year. That's the year of Jubilee. Their rivers and their seas parted in front of them when they walked. Jericho and other mighty cities fell when they fought. They were a funny little nation, but they had a God who acted on their behalf. That's the point. God purposefully put them at disadvantage, so they had to throw themselves on his mercy, and he got glory for himself. So, uh, Exodus 20, 24, God is talking about how to build altars, and it sums up his attitude perfectly. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. From the beginning, when he created the nation of Israel and brought them out of Egypt, he did signs and wonders. We think of the ten plagues and parting the river, the, sorry, the Red Sea and Israel walking through. God showed off. 
And whenever he showed off and he did something memorable, he said, take that piece of land and build an altar out of uncut stones, which is an interesting thing to say. Don't cut the stone, use whole stones and build me an altar. In fact, when Israel crossed over the river Jordan on their way to Jericho, it says the head of each tribe of Israel took a stone from the riverbed that was dry as they were walking through it and planted that on the other side and made an altar on the other side of the river Jordan. Where did these stones come from? From the bottom of the river that's now dried up. And their job was to tell their children and that their children would tell their children and their children would tell their children. Israel would receive blessing for making those altars to the Lord because of what God had done, and God would get the glory. That was the whole point of altars. Well, let's go back and talk about stones and what that means, because these altars are made out of stones. 1 Kings 6, 7. The house, while it was being built, was built of stone prepared at the quarry. That word prepared is shalem. And that word means complete, full, just, made ready, peaceable, quiet, and whole. It's similar to the word shalom, which means, of course, peace. So God, when he's having the temple built by Solomon on the temple grounds, he wants whole, peaceable stones used on his temple. Interesting. Interesting. A lot of metaphor going on here. When we get to the New Testament, people become the stones. All right. 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the cornerstone. We are also living stones. If you look at even Simon Peter's name, Jesus sees Simon and he says, you're now going to be called Cephas or Peter, which means rock. So God is really trying to get across in the New Testament. He's very explicit. People are stones. People are living stones. Okay, what's the point? If you look at the events that take place in a typical Sunday morning service, we have a lot of machinery, a lot of kili. Lights and sound and production cues and live streams and all of this stuff that we need to do to make things happen. And even the systems of how we run Sunday morning church services have become very produced. There's production notes, this thing is going to last this many minutes, this thing is going to last this many minutes. That's a lot of stuff prepared. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. Kali is not bad. I mean, some of it's very practical. You can't talk to 500 people without a sound system. But if we allow those man-made tools and those apparatuses to become too precious to us, we are in danger of offering unacceptable sacrifices. Why? Because God doesn't rest his presence on man-made apparatuses. He didn't rest it on a wagon. He wouldn't not allow it. And David got in trouble and a man lost his life over it. God doesn't rest his presence on machines. And he doesn't even like the sound of them in his temple, which is why those stones had to be whole and ready to go and peaceable when they arrived at the temple. It's because God didn't even want the sound of those machines on top of his temple. It wasn't acceptable to him. If we think that those machines are so important to us, the lights and the sound and the production cues and the produced sound and having things a certain way, that they become running us rather than us running them, we're in trouble. And them running us means this machine can't stop, right? Have you ever had that mindset in a Sunday morning service? That feeling like there's stress and strife and contentiousness and feeling undervalued, and low joy, and burnout. And then 10 a.m. shows up, and we all put on a happy face, and we sweep that conflict under the rug, and we make Sunday happen. That's the sound of tools being scraped together on the temple grounds where God wanted 
whole stones. Why? Because people are the whole stones that God wants. And if we use the machinery of Sunday, whether it's the equipment or whether it's the churn of we have to get this done by 10 o'clock and we start to cut the stones, if we cut people, if we hurt people in that process and try and justify it by saying, well, this is ministry, you know, sometimes it's hard. We have to make sure that this gets done so that when people file in on Sunday morning, we have a calm atmosphere where everyone, everything is as it should be, and it runs from 10 o'clock to 11.15 exactly, and then we get them out so that we can get the next service in. If in our machinery we hurt the stones, that is unacceptable to God because the people are what God is using to build his temple. The people are the stones. The people are what matter. So what's the alternative? Peace. I'll leave you with one last scripture. This is from James 3, 15 through 18. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. See you on the next episode.